Well, good morning. Thank you for joining us. I am Tamara Scott, and we are Truth For Our Time, giving you news that will help you when the headlines hit home. You know, if God's expected you to live through it, he's directed you how to do it somewhere in his word. And so we bring you God's word in today's world. Every Everything we deal with has already been filtered through the word of God, and there's a, there's a way we can know how to do it, how to live with it. And so uh, today we're not going to dwell on the common core like we have been doing. We've, we've devoted so much time to that because it's such an important topic. But today I have some really um, cool guests. I'm excited to bring you in. One is already in studio through Skype and we'll be talking to him shortly. Lee Stranahan, reporter who's been with Huffington Post and Breitbart News, which there's, you know, I don't know how you get much further on the end of the spectrum than those two organizations. And then Dr. Charles Nestor will be joining us and we'll be talking about his nativity program. He He's had Operation Nativity, gosh, probably six years, seven years that I've been interviewing him every Christmas on this when we when we had the uh, opportunity opportunity to do so. So uh, they'll be joining us. I do need to make an announcement on Common Core, even though we're not going to focus on it as far as a segment of the show today. I got a phone call on my way in from the Iowa activist. If you are in Iowa, please contact your legislators. If you are in Iowa, please contact your legislators Today, today, most of them give you their cell phone numbers. If not, call their home phone numbers or call. You can try and call the state house. I think some of them will be at the state house today as well. I don't know that the switchboard is up and running there or not, but, but contact them, email them. You can always use their email addresses. Calling is better. They can ignore email. That ringing is annoying and they must address it. Let them know that common core is dangerous. It is uh, corporate communistic takeover of the classroom, quite frankly. It is unhealthy for our children. You do not want it. The cost will be quite uh, imperative uh, for Iowa. Henry Burke has said $186 million to $192 million just for implementation. That is not upkeep. That is not the testing. The testing, you remember, Smarter Balance is one of the consortiums that's wanting to uh, do our testing. And if we go with them for just the math and English portion, just the math and English portion of the test, which now costs $3 a student, it will cost $27 to $30 per student. Take that times the number of students in each grade times the number of 12 grades, and it's going to be incredibly expensive. If you think that you are beholden to the government now with your taxes, this is one more way that big government wants to suck you in through your children, not to mention the data collection, 400 points of data being sucked out and harvested and extracted from your children in the classroom through tests, through assignments, through other avenues. So uh, I'm being very graphic because it is very graphic. And uh, I was just with uh, Governor Huckabee this past week in Arkansas, had time to speak with him on it. I wish I could come back and tell you he gets it. He understands it. Uh, I am pleased to tell you that he is now backing away from it. Um, But if anyone's still promoting to you the idea of state standards, that the state should set the standard, again, it sounds lovely, but the Constitution is there to stop us from our own best intentions. We just got away from state standards for homeschooling parents here in Iowa last year. Remember how thrilled we were? Let's not go right back into state standards that will affect, unimpact all students, whether they're homeschooled, private schooled, or public schooled, because the test will be what drives the curriculum. And no matter how you school your student, what curriculum you use, they will be penalized unless they have curriculum that is aligned to the common core test. We do not want a state standard. It sounds odd, I know. But we're competitive, and when schools start having uh, great results, that competition will be what raises the tide for all levels. So uh, call your legislators today. It is imperative today. Why? Because several of them are meeting. Several of them are having committee meetings, and they're talking about Common Core. And as much as we'd like to think they know, uh, they understand it, they don't. And you've heard the commercials on other radio stations here in Iowa promoting Common Core. Uh, Our own Department of Education, for some reason, is promoting Common Core. If you have time to do research on your computer, we could use your help searching the money trails, follow the money to see who's getting money where. And another update along that line, I'll just segue right into it. Alice Linehan, one of our guests we had on the show a couple weeks ago. You remember her? Just this mom traveling the state of Texas. We know how big Texas is, right? Her own car, her own tires, having having blowouts. And in fact, the man who mocked her for missing a meeting because her tire, her flat tire, is the same man 
who is facing allegations that he's being funded as a lobbyist. Uh, I think it's Microsoft. I'm not sure on that. But he's also the same man, Thomas Ratliff, who is filing ethics charges against her. Remember, he filed the charges. He's filed another one. So I must tell you, she's, she's making headway. So on one hand, he mocks her for being a, 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 a mom with, you know, not making it to a meeting because of a tire blowout. And that's according to Alice that he did that. You can find that on her website, Women on the Wall, Women on the Wall, or uh, I think it's Empowering Voices. Um, do a search for Alice Linehan. You will find her L-I-N-A-H-A-N. And the next time, in the next moment, he's uh, alleging that she's a, a lobbyist and should be registered as if there were big funds in there. So um, that's what we're dealing with in Texas as well. Again, if we follow the money, we'll find out where these things usually come from. My first guest today uh, is one of those investigative reporters that must follow the money, that must follow the leads, that must have that curiosity and that ability to dig uh Lee Stranahan is joining me today, and I don't know for all of you viewers and listeners what your faith is, and, and I'm probably, uh, I, I don't, I don't just, this is not just a Christian radio show that I've had on other Christian radio stations. This is more of a show on, on issues we deal with, and I do come at it with a Christian worldview, and I, I'm not shy about that. But I have to tell you, yesterday I, I was, um, I hadn't yet found my guest for today's show, and I just, I wasn't in a panic about it. I knew that God must have something prepared, but I was, I was starting to think, Lord, I don't know what it is. Sometimes I feel like I'm supposed to wait because something's going to come up. And so, of course, we had the, the judge in Utah that ruled that uh, now it's okay for polygamy, which is one of those red herrings that people said would never happen, even though I was on air saying it's going to happen. And so I thought maybe that's it. And I'm walking through my house, and I'm just praying, Lord, you better bring me a guest. If this is your show, and it is, and it's your airtime, then I need you to bring me a guest. And my phone rang. And Lee Stranahan was on the phone. Lee, uh, by his own definition, is a writer, a teacher, a filmmaker, a photographer, and a tech geek. He says his wife, Lauren, and he home, uh, they unschool their children. He's worked um, on the left and wrote for the Huffington Post and until he met Andrew Breitbart. And then his life changed. And he worked with Andrew exposing Pigford, Occupy Wall Street, in the institutional left. After his loss, he says he tries to carry on the legacy of Andrew Bartbert and change the culture. He writes about news and politics for Breitbart News and, and more. Lee, thank you for joining me today. Thanks so much for having me. I appreciate it. Thank I, you. I appreciate you taking time out of your schedule. I, I, should, I should also mention I'm friends with Alice Linehan, by the way. Uh, do you know Alice Linehan? I sure do. Yeah, she and I work together on a project. She lives about a half hour from me. <laughs> Uh, I live in Dallas, and uh, Al and Alice, uh, you've had her on the show, but I, I can just absolutely attest. I mean, she is a committed, she's no lobbyist. She's a committed mother. Uh, I, you know, I've met her kids. I've been to her house and uh, met her husband, and uh, she's just a committed wife and mother who is deeply passionate about issues, and uh, I'm, I'm proud to know her, but I just thought I'd throw that in for uh, since all the craziness going on with Alice now but uh but I've known her for known her for a while out here cuz she's just a, another passionate uh <coughs> conservative activist. And here's the problem with doing a Skype show is that you can I tear up. And t the fact that you know Alice it's just such a small world and I just love all these connections that God just lays out in my life. I don't think anything happens by consequence and so that you know Alice and and just what a what a great <clears throat> I don't know warm circle uh, people who are seeking truth and I just it's always encouraging to meet and and to find that you have mutual friends so thank you for giving Alice uh, a little affirmation there and, and for talking to our listeners about who she is we could tell on the show she was authentic and so are you oh, yeah, have you yeah. have you gotten into the common core issue um thank god I homeschool yeah <laughs> that's that's all I'll say. Every time I see a uh, a school shooting tragedy right. or hear about right. Common Core, my wife and I are just so glad we that we've been homeschooling for 16 years. We are uh, my oldest son Shane is 21 now, and he was homeschooled pretty much his whole life. Uh, he went to school for about a year and a half, and. Uh, uh, but but we're just so glad that we homeschool. We're we're really blessed in Texas. If, but it's one of the reasons we moved to Texas, right? It's because we have great homeschooling laws 
by great homeschooling laws, I mean, they leave us alone. Right. We don't have to, we don't have to do anything. So we've lived in uh, New Mexico and California. And, and California, you can get around stuff. New Mexico's okay. But Texas is just uh, laissez-faire. They just leave you alone. So. Y'all like your liberty. There's just... Yeah, it's, it's, it, it's, it, it re- really, we moved to Texas because of the homeschooling laws and the grocery stores. Um, as, as a writer, I can kind of live anywhere I want to. And uh, I, I'm not fixed in one spot. And so uh, they have the best grocery stores in the world here. So that's nice because, you, you know, we eat. And uh, the homeschool laws are awesome. And then there's no state income tax, which I love, too. <laughs> yes, and, and uh, your governor has proven himself. You know, there was some when he ran for president in the last election, and he had the issue with his, per, his uh, prescription drugs after his back surgery. There were some yeah. that thought maybe he was finished, and yet I'm hearing from others he's proven himself once again. Maybe his debate performance wasn't strong, but he's proven himself with his uh, jobs, his economic policy. Uh, Texas continues to flourish with, while other states are surviving and many others are facing debt. And so, you know, you have to decide, do we want somebody who is a performer, who is maybe an excellent debater, or do we want someone who is um, able to to execute the task of being president? Yeah, we have we have a wealth of, I mean, and Ted Cruz is my senator. That's that's not bad. You're doubly blessed. And uh, right. Yeah. So, I mean, I mean, I'm I'm one of those, you know, uh, there are people I'm not Texan by birth. You know, it 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 took me 40 years. But uh, but uh, and my friend Dana Lash just started with uh, Glenn Beck and the Blaze. So she and her family just moved out here from St. Louis. She's another person who was a good friend of Andrew Breitbart's <clears throat> and a, a real conservative warrior. uh uh, uh, another tough conservative chick and uh, she and her husband I love and they moved out here. And so, so it's, it's good. Texas, is, it, it, it's a great place to be. We had the ice storm. I'm not going to complain because you guys certainly get your share of weather there, but, uh, but, uh, but yeah, no, we love it here in Texas and people like Alice are, are part of it. We have great tea party groups. Uh, yeah. It's just, a, it's a very good place to be very, very good place to be right now. And so um, I met Dana Lesh as well. So I, 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 we're thankful for Texas. And in fact, my mother's in Texas right now for the winter. So uh, pl- plan to get down there sometime myself while it's cold and flurrying here in Iowa. So uh, look forward to being there. I, okay. So Lee, you just kind of walked into my trap yesterday. I just <laughs> had prayed to the Lord that he would show me who he wanted to have as a guest today. And you happened to call me on another matter. And we were just talking about some of the other topics and, Thank you, one, for your work as an investigative reporter. Uh, do you still write for the Huffington Post? No, I, you know, I, I stayed at the Huffington Post, which, by the way, is in, in, interesting because Andrew Breitbart's one, the Huffington Post was Andrew Breitbart's idea. Um, Andrew worked for Ariana Huffington when she was a conservative, and he kept working for her after she became a liberal. And it was literally the Huffington Post, he told me the story, uh, was his notion was that Ariana should take her golden Rolodex, as he called it, <laughs> and start a, a, a website where people could blog about stuff. And uh, so it's really interesting because uh, I got into the Huffington Post from doing internet comedy. I, I During one of the writer's strikes about six years ago, I... Uh, uh, I I did some YouTube comedy when when YouTube was only about a year or so old, and uh, I I was a liberal at the time, so I made fun of Republicans, and I found that making fun of Republicans is the quick way to success in Hollywood. It's uh, true. Where lit. I mean, and by the way, I'm not even joking about that. I mean, literally, yeah. I I went from uh, nobody. I was working at NBC to getting 35,000 views overnight, to being on CNN within a week, and getting a meeting with the head of comedy development at NBC within two weeks. And it, it, it really was just based on, I was making fun of Republicans. And, uh, uh, it, and, and then I was at an Obama victory party given by the director of Anchorman, Adam McKay. So I'm sitting next to Will Ferrell, I'm sitting next to Gina Gershon, 
Andrew Breitbart really understood this because he, he grew up in Hollywood. When you leave the left, when you give up liberalism, he's, the way Andrew described it is he said, you're giving up invitations to the best parties in the world. Right. Which is, which is, which is true. And, and at, at a certain point, you just have to, you know, you, I, I made a decision that I'd rather have the truth than the, uh, the fun parties with the celebrities. Uh, and, the, you know, they were fun. It's fun to see celebrities. So, uh, uh, but, but when I met Andrew, I was writing for HuffPost. I was on the left. And Andrew was the most hated guy in the world. Every liberal hated Andrew Breitbart. And I found out that we had a mutual friend, so I could interview him. And I like interviewing. I, I interview all kinds of people. I've interviewed film directors and musicians and politicians and uh, Michelle Bachman and Steve King, you know, from Iowa. And so I, I like interviewing people. And I, I, I called Andrew, and, you know, he's the most hated conservative in the world. And we ended up talking for three hours, and I just liked the dude. He was like, we were talking, you know, I'm... I, I'm, I'm in my 40s. Andrew was in his 40s. He's a little younger than me. But we were talking about like Depeche Mode and the Smiths and all these 80s bands that we liked. And, uh, and you know, in politics, and David, he was a big David Letterman in the 80s fan, a big comedy fan. And uh, we ended up working together on this Pig for Black Farmers fraud story where Andrew wanted a liberal working on the story because he wanted it to get taken seriously. And subsequently, after Andrew died, the New York Times vindicated our reporting with a front page report on this pig for black farmers fraud. But when, uh, when I met Andrew, we very quickly started working together. And then in the course of, of uh, working with him and working on these stories and losing uh, every liberal friend of mine, as soon as I started working with Andrew Breitbart, they weren't even curious. They just hated my guts. Right. And uh, after I lost all my friends... <laughs> Um, and they attacked me as racist and stuff like that. Uh, literally, people who were friends of mine who wrote for me. When I say was I, I was on the left, I did work for Move On. I, I was friends with people at Media Matters. I did work for, for the unions. I was a video producer for, for the unions and stuff like that. And uh, uh, after, uh, after working with Andrew and seeing the real viciousness of the left, and then going to CPAC and meeting, uh, you have to understand, I grew up in Massachusetts, and then I moved to California when I turned 18. So uh, I didn't know conservatives. I mean, there's no other way to put it. I literally, like, <laughs> like, I, like I knew two, like when I worked at, I worked on a TV show called Access Hollywood. Right. And there was about 150 people who worked on that show. It's a big, it's like a 150 person company. And, uh, I knew the conservative. That was John. He was a conservative in that company. <laughs> and that's it. Everybody knew John. Oh, John's a conservative. He was like a circus animal or something. And uh, you just literally don't know people who are conservatives. And uh, so after I went to CPAC and after I dealt with conservatives and people like Dana Lash and, you know, I was like, well, wait a minute. These people aren't, you know, I, I met Michelle Bachman. And she didn't, like, hold a cross to my head. <laughs> she and wasn't the kook you had been told she was. Not at all. She was a, 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 a clearly intelligent, a very, very intelligent, very focused uh, person who knew the issues. And there's no better way to put it. So that really changed me. And then when Andrew died, I talked to Andrew about three hours before he passed. He and I became friends. We talked every day. And then when he passed... Uh, I knew about it the night before, but when I saw the outpouring for him, I thought about it. I was kind of, I, I, I wasn't a liberal uh, for, after three months after I met him, I was like, I'm not a liberal. Democrats are disgusting to me uh, because they were, but I was nothing. I was like, I'm independent now, maybe, I guess, independent. Then uh, after Andrew died, I'm like, well, if Andrew was a conservative, uh, I guess I'm a conservative. <laughs> I guess I went through issues. I went through and I thought about it and I'm like, you know what? I agree. I, you know, I, 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 I'm like, I'm pro, I'm pro life now. I'm like, I'm just, I went through all the issues. I'm like, I guess I'm a conservative. So, uh, I, I, you know, I, I, I sort of realized that I'd made that transition. And, uh, then I continued to write for Breitbart news for about 18 months, uh, 
I had quit the Huffington Post after they had, I told Andrew, I thought he should get his message out to a wider audience. So he wrote for the Huffington Post and he did a couple of columns that they put on the front page and editors at the Huffington Post threatened to quit because this, this shows you how liberals <laughs> like free speech. So much for that tolerant, open-minded group that the, the media likes to pretend that they are and Hollywood likes to suggest that we should be. Oh, that's, yeah, it's a complete, uh, it, Andrew told me the first conversation, he said there's a much bigger tent on the right. And I was like, ha ha, yeah, you're, that's funny. And uh, there's a much bigger tent on the right. I mean, I don't know how else to put it. I mean, I'm, I'm in the Andrew Breitbart camp of, of uh, I'm a big tent conservative in that I want to get as many people in as possible. I'm, but that doesn't mean compromising the issues. I think the mistake a lot of people make is they think, oh, well, the way to get a bigger tent is let's have no standards. Right. And I'm the opposite. I think we, I think we need to have standards. And I think we need to have uh, uh, discussion about about stuff. And the uh, and I know plenty of my friends are Christian conservatives, and I know people who are sort of more libertarian-y conservatives. And and uh, I I you know I'm the person who ends up being uh, you know I'll talk to people from like uh, Go Proud, the gay conservative group, and they'll say stuff about Rick Santorum, and I'm like, no, no, I don't. I'm like. We, I'm like I Rick Santorum absolutely. <laughs> I, I have to defend Santorum to them, but then I'm also in favor of of I you know I I, I have friends who are also gay conservatives, and uh, who who are you know down the road on a number of issues, and as long as as long as they adhere to certain principles, uh, I have no problem with that either. So I'm I'm a big tent conservative, but I think the way Andrew did it was right, which is you you have to. I'm in favor of open, honest discussion. If you're in favor of this, that's fine. I agree uh, with you on the open, honest discussion. As far as yeah. the gay conservatives, well, I understand that we have conservatives within the Republican Party, and, and that's fine that they've decided that other things are more important than certain preferences. But there are yeah. certain things we can't give on. There are certain principles. Our founding fathers made this Constitution so clearly on God's law, natural, on nature's law. Blackstone right. talks about it in his commentaries. Um you know, so many of our founding fathers discuss it, John Locke and his treatises, two treatises on government. So uh, no matter what somebody describes himself to be, no matter what their their uh, preferences may be, no matter what their um, um, uh, inclinations may be, whether they were born or not born with them, all irrelevant, as long yeah. as they fit to the same principles based on nature's law, God's law. And then we can then we can deal with that and move forward in that constitution. And we, and, but I agree with you. We can have open, honest communication, and we don't have to have. I, I, I get tired. I don't know about you, but you don't have to inflame to inform. As a as someone who's on radio, I I almost skid to the microphone because I I am not here to spout off my opinion. What I think really doesn't right. matter. It's what God's already said about a situation. It's what our constitution has laid out for a situation. And if we don't like our constitution, then there is a a method in which we change it that is not easy, nor is it quick for a reason. So now, Andrew, and you've, we've already hit on maybe a couple things that we don't all necessarily agree with, and that's what I think is the beauty of this show. I had uh, uh, Meg Norris on here a couple weeks ago who we laughed uh, on air. She's a Democrat and I'm a Republican, and, and we, you know, yet we could come together on the concern for Common Core. You said to me on the phone yesterday, and I hope it's okay or maybe you, you don't want it out, where you're at in your spiritual journey. And, you know, we don't always agree on everything 100%, but, but you had written an article that I thought was even more interesting that you don't declare yourself a Christian, and yet you saw the need, you saw the concern, Christians being um, persecuted, murdered, martyred in the Middle East. And you felt you had to go over there, bring our listeners into to your, what you found in Syria and the Middle East. Well, yeah, I was, so I was working on this story when I was writing for Breitbart about the, uh, uh, we we use the term persecution. Let's go beyond that. M literally, murder, uh, martyrdom of uh, of Christians in the Middle East. And I was I was reporting from my you know office here in Dallas about what was going on in Syria 
where not only were Christians being attacked in this town called Malula, which is about 45 miles south, uh, north of Damascus, which is one of the last places on earth where Aramaic is spoken. And I was reporting on it, and I was, uh, because of the time difference, I would be up at like 2 or 3 in the morning trying to catch news that was coming out at like 9 in the morning Middle Eastern time, if that makes sense. And so I was writing all night about this stuff. And uh, I was trying to call over there to because the problem is in Syria, the uh, Assad regime, which is not awesome, they're not a good, they're not good, right? But the rebels aren't good either. And so they're both trying to spin the story like, okay, well, the Assad regime will say this, the, uh, the, the rebels will say that. And I'm trying to get to the truth. So uh, I, I, there's no better way to say it. I felt called to go over there, it suddenly came into my head all at once. I have to go to the Middle East, and I have to go to Lebanon, and because uh, that's where the refugees are. And I'm going to go to Beirut, and I knew I'd be safe because my wife's not going to let me uh, go traipse into a war zone. <laughs> and and uh, sorry. Uh, and, uh, she, you know, she's concerned about my safety. And uh, I, I raised money online. Uh, I raised money on Twitter and Facebook, and people knew that it, uh, I'd never covered an international story, but people knew from my reporting on Occupy Wall Street and from other things that I'm very good at getting to the truth that other people aren't good at getting at for whatever reason. I, I'm very good at, at getting to the truth. So I was able to raise the money very quickly, and then the people at Breitbart weren't overly thrilled with the idea of me going uh, over there for some reason. I never pinned down exactly why. They didn't want me to cover the story. And even when I went over, they didn't cover my reporting. But, I, but t two weeks later, I'm sitting on a couch, you know, this, this, right next to, right, you know, like right here, a woman who had, was in Malula, whose husband had a machine gun put to his head by the Muslims, uh, the Muslim jihadist who smashed their cross, grabbed their Virgin Mary, threw it on the ground, uh, who shot and killed three people, left them to bleed to die because they would not renounce Christianity. And I'm hearing it not from 6,000 miles away from a report, from a report, from a report, but from a woman who was there uh, uh, sharing coffee with her, talking to her family, talking about her fear that her daughter would be raped, and, and talking about how her Muslim neighbors were in on the attack. They, the Muslim neighbors said, no, that's where the, Christ, the Christians are in that house, and that house, and that house. Uh, stuff that nobody had reported. And did you that, know this woman before she sat down on your sofa and told you this stuff? Had you no, known her before? No, no. So, you know, so Lee, once again, it's God moving mysteriously in your life, aligning things. I just love this. Now, we have to take a break. We're going to be right back after this, so please don't go. Stay tuned. But um, you can call into the conversation as well, 877-244-0077, 877-244-0077. We've got to take a break. We'll be right back. This is Tamira Scott, Truth For Our Time. We're powered with webcast1live.com, and we'll, we'll see you right after the break. Hey, psst. let me let you in on a little secret. You ready? Always try to do business with people, not places. Especially if you seek honest Christian business people. And when it comes to my car, I really need to trust who's working on it. Now, my family is so blessed. A few years ago, we found a family-owned automobile repair shop that operates as a Christian business also. Open. Honest, reliable, trustworthy. It's Amco on Hickman Road in front of Kmart. And it's a family-owned Christian operating business. This family treats your car as if it was their car. Everything from oil changes to transmission repair and everything in between. So the next time you feel the need to be at peace with your choice of who you can trust with your car, give Amco on Hickman a chance to serve you. And tell them Max sent you. All across America, there are countless numbers of people struggling with addiction and other life-controlling issues. Probably someone you know and love. There is a way out. There is hope. Transformations Treatment Center in Delray Beach, Florida has a unique approach to substance abuse treatment. 
Call now and ask about our guaranteed success program or log on to transformationstreatment.com. Transformations. Change your life. Change your relationships. Transform your world. Get away from us, you mean old credit card. We don't have any more money. We're in trouble now. Save us! Help! Somebody save us! Somebody help! Help! Save us! Hi, I'm Tom Coates from Consumer Credit of Des Moines. If your credit card's a little too animated, give us a call. And good morning. I am Tamara Scott. Lee Stranahan is joining me today. Lee was a writer with the Breitbart, with the Huffington Post, and then with Andrew Breitbart, working to um, expose uh, the institutional left. And today, even though Lee would describe himself as not necessarily a born again believer or a Christian by our definition, he did see the concern and the uh, mistreatment and murder of people in the Middle East simply because they define themselves as Christians. And I think this is very timely as we've just come through the crisis where our president wanted to intervene in Syria. And and to be honest with you, as we begin into America, hearing people like uh, Shay Feldman, the chair of the Equal Opportunity Commission, saying that she can't think of a time when our Christian beliefs, our deeply held religious beliefs would ever trump rights of homosexual homosexuals. So we certainly have some issues we need to deal with here as we see couples in Iowa now facing charges simply because they chose not to accept business um, that went against their deeply held religious convictions. They're losing money by not taking business, and now now they're facing charges. Uh, as, as the man with uh, Hobby Lobby says, I shouldn't have to lose my faith to be in business or lose my business to keep my faith. And this is what made America so great. And it's so tragic to see it's misrepresented, misused. But let's go back, see what happens in those countries where we don't have these liberties, where we haven't honored God, and where our rights come from people, not from our creator. Uh, Lee, we when we left off, you were just talking about the woman who had sat down with you on the sofa and your trip to Malala. So if you could just discuss it with us a little bit. Yeah, sure. Well, I, w- I went to, uh, so I went to Lebanon, and within three days, I, I had met uh, with the Maronite Archbishop of the uh, Maronite Catholic Church. The uh, churches over there are typically Eastern Rites churches. Uh, I attended a service because uh, I wanted to see it. I did not understand a single word that they said, uh, but it was fascinating because it's a, it, it, a, a, an Easter Rite church they really, I, 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 they take their religion seriously in a way that you don't really see in, in America. Um, I, and all I mean by that is there was no, like a lot of churches now, uh, there's a certain entertainment aspect that Americans right. expect. Right. Right. We, we and I'm not knocking it. There's not. It's it's just another. It's another way of and, of, uh, and not in all churches. But you're right. It, it, uh, and we uh, we within the church have seen it sweep over many churches. That's right. And so there's good. You know, for instance, a lot of churches now have very good lighting, and and you know, great sound systems and and wonderful video systems. I've done consulting for churches on video systems. The, this was just st- very somber. Uh, uh, they 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 take it uh, like I say it was there was no entertainment aspect to it it was straight up religion beautiful churches by the way incredible uh, you know architecture and paintings and stuff like that but it was very very interesting and I met with the uh, patriarch of Babylon the head of the Iraqi Catholic Church and everybody I spoke to confirmed that Christianity is under direct attack in the Middle East people are being killed for no other reason than that they're, they're Christians. And the danger is that what's happened, you know, what happened in Malula, the people who were attacking the Christians were supported by the U.S. So when we talk about Obama's uh, war on Christianity, we mean that metaphorically to a certain extent here in the United States. You know, uh, what's going on is legal maneuvers and stuff like that. But it's literally what's happening 
in the Middle East. There's literally a war on Christians that, that the United States has been supporting. And um, I do see it as all of one piece. You know, you talk about, we, we talked about uh, the gay marriage issue briefly before. The one thing that's 100% clear is that the gay marriage movement, the political movement from the left, is not just, if, and Andrew Breitbart used to say this, look, if it was just about getting rights for uh, hospital visitations, right, right. They, would have done, they would have accepted civil unions. The, the, the movement would have said, okay, well, civil union solves that problem for us. It is, an, it is a clear attack on Christianity. There's no question about it. The same way aspects of Obamacare are a clear attack on Christianity. And you can see this with the Hobby Lobby case, with the uh, one, one of the things I realized, it was a big, when I was on the left, I would hear people like Glenn Beck talk about Saul Alinsky. And I thought it was crazy talk. Like, okay, well, it's crazy, nutty talk. I was like, I'm a liberal. I've never read Saul Alinsky. Well, a few months after I met Andrew, he said, you should really read Rules for Radicals. <laughs> and I did, and sure enough, it's dedicated to Lucifer uh-huh. right up front. And then I started to do some independent research on Alinsky, and I realized, uh, I found out that he was, by his own admission, friends with Al Capone and the mob, with literally murderers. And then I realized that Hillary Clinton knew Alinsky and wrote about him, and that Obama was a student of Alinsky's works and taught Alinsky. And I started to realize, and this, is, this relates to the Christian issue, that the, at the center of leftism uh, is, first off, they... they and I'm not saying every liberal, but I'm saying liberalism as a movement, leftism as a movement, uh, hates American values, but at core, it hates uh, Judeo-Christian values. Right. Very, very, very clearly. You, you, don't get, you don't dedicate your book to Lucifer accidentally. That means something. And you don't do it lightly as a joke either. And you don't do it lightly as a joke. No, absolutely not. And when you realize that Alinsky literally knew murderers in the Al Capone gang, there's no morality. There's a, a complete amorality. He, he describes it sort of laughingly. He's not, and uh, it's amazing. And so uh, I, I saw that happening. And um, in the Middle East, it's, you can see the consequences of the Obama foreign policy. Six million people displaced in Syria. This is all as a result of the Arab Spring, which put the Muslim Brotherhood in, into thing. So I came back, and I'm working on a documentary. I'm trying to get a documentary going about this. And it's going to cover not just what's happening in Syria and the Middle East, but also what's happening in the U.S., where, uh, you know, my, my take is whatever your opinion on, on same-sex marriage the clear line is people should be free to have a business and not and pick what they want to do. Because, look, here's where that's going. There's no question in my mind. It's a bakery today. It's the church tomorrow. Absolutely. Where, what they're setting this up for is so that they can sue the Catholic church or the local Baptist church or whoever and say, well, no, you have to marry these people because you're a business or you have to hire, or you have, That's, you're absolutely right, which is why I think it, that we're at the point where we need religious liberty laws in place in every state legislature. Uh, I think that no matter what someone wants to say as far as who they support or someone's rights, they should admit or um, be called to question if they will uphold the First Amendment written with its intention of, of protecting the freedom of the church, the yes. religious liberty of each Christian or otherwise, as individuals, and and what? and Lee, I'd love to talk it in another show because there's so many of these issues. Whether it was the hospital visitation, or whether it's the inheritance, the woman who went to the Supreme Court this last this last year over her inheritance. If we would change laws, and again go back to bi- biblical principle, uh, the Bible says in the Old Testament that the prince should not take the inheritance of his people. There should right. not be an inheritance tax. If we did away with the inheritance tax, that case would have had no standing in the Supreme Court, and we wouldn't be dealing with the fallout. To try and change laws to cover up original or existing bad laws will only lead to more bad policy. We need to get the government out of the inheritance tax, 
out of our income tax, quit punishing people for making money. And there are other things we can do as well, payroll deductions, um, again with benefits. We're going to have to be asking our, our, our elected officials and our candidates, would you support paid benefits for partners, same-sex partners, when we get into tax dollars. If a private company wants to do it, that's their business. But when we get into tax dollars, state workers, federal workers, teachers, you're going to ask taxpayers to have, allow their money to be used in something you disagree with. Again, let's do away with payroll deductions. Insurance should not be a provision of your, your employer. It should be done privately. You buy your product, you'll get a better quality product, you'll be, uh, be able to get more of a uh, competitive price, and we do away with the government being involved at all as to who can be partners and who cannot. Well, and I, I think the thing is, there's, um, it's obvious to me, it's obvious to me from, from doing deep reporting on these issues, from really, really, really drilling down into these issues, that there is an intentional war yes. on Christ Christianity specifically, uh, but Judeo-Christian values in general. Um, and you can see it culturally where, it, you know, it, if, if I had a show and I had a buffoonish Christian character, no one, no one culturally would think, okay, well, that's, that's fine. But, you know, if I had an, an intentionally buffoonist Muslim character, <laughs> I, I'd be criticized all over the place. When the Danish so, cartoon came out, mums were be, mums, nuns were beheaded. No, no, exactly right. And even on Benghazi, for instance, um, uh, the, I've done deep research on that. And the video was actually, it was actually part of what the attack was over. That was, in fact, what part of the attack was over. And it doesn't let the Obama administration off the hook. I've done a lot of deep, deep research on this. And they knew about that video coming out days before. It was publicized on Egyptian TV. And uh, it makes it worse. But, but what we, we have two big dangers right now. Forget the dangers of politicians. We have a horrible media that simply, aside from being ideologically biased, is lazy. And then we've got a culture where of TV, film, and everything else... Part of the reason Romney was able to be beat was because we have all these stereotypes of, you know, evil rich guys. And all the Obama administration had to do was say, well, look, he's an evil rich guy. And, and people were like, oh, yeah, okay, okay I know what that's like. They, they, they never talked about, you know, Mitt, Mitt Romney helping get a tree stump out of a neighbor's yard or stuff or like that. Or spending his own money to go find a child that was lost or kidnapped. It's, it's like when Andrew first talked to me about Mich uh, Michelle Bachman, uh, when I was on the left, he said, because I, I, he brought up Bachman, I'm like, well, she's, you know, crazy and stupid. And he's like, no, no. He's like, did you know that she's uh, had like 22 foster kids? Yeah. I said, uh, no. He said, he said, well, what, what would you think of her if you knew that she had all those foster kids? And I said, uh, she's like a decent person. He's like, yeah, there you go. And I ask every liberal friend of mine, every smart people, not dumb people, smart, informed people. I said, did you know Michelle uh, Bachman has 22 foster kids? Not a single, not one single liberal friend of mine had ever heard that. Well, why is that? Once again, it's because no, they don't want her to be a decent person. They don't want her to be a person. When you hear she's got 22 foster kids, she when she's now when she speaks on life issues people would be like okay well she gets to talk about that because she's walking the walk right that's why the media buries it and so they do this stuff where uh this the the stuff i saw in the middle east it's been reported a little tiny bit a little bit it has gotten out but really there's a gigantic crisis over there a huge crisis for christians for Muslims who aren't extremist Muslims, they're getting killed massively. Uh, and the Christians want to live in peace. And uh, some of the Muslims want to live in peace. But Al-Qaeda has built into a military power. And we don't hear people talking about that. Al-Qaeda now has tanks and chemical weapons. Al-Qaeda took over oil fields in Syria. You can look this up. You'll see it. It's been re not, not reported by like you know, fringe press by Reuters. They've taken over. 
Lee, the, we've got it. We've got to go to a break. We've got a break. We've got to come, and when we come back, we've got to have Dr. Charles Nestor, who's going to talk to us about the uh, nativity operation. Nativity. We just had a live nativity on the steps or on the U.S. Capitol, the U.S. Supreme Court property, and I think that is incredible. So we want to get him in here today. But Lee, um, hang around. Uh, will you come back and finish this conversation with me? We could, I'll check with Ryan. Ryan, I don't know if you've got time even today. We can we could tape this for our Christmas show. Actually, it's up to you, Lee. Let's talk during the break and see what we've got available here okay. because we're just getting into the meat of what you're seeing over there in Syria. I know you've got photos to show, so let's talk during the break. But we've got to go to break right now. I am Tamara Scott. Truth for our time. We're being powered by WebcastOneLive.com. Stay with us. <laughs> From the REMAX Real Estate Concept Studios, this is Webcast One Live. I'm Brian Leach, owner and general manager of Service Legends. I brought a long couple of the uh, home comfort heroes. <laughs> Hi, I'm Tammy Wells. I am Nick Wondershot. I am administrative manager. I am the senior technician. From Service Legends. It seems like every good thing, when you feel it to the bone that it's good, there's a lot of hard work put behind it. You just, I, I don't think that you can fake it and have it turn out good. You know, if we seem like, okay, that's just weird, it's just a furnace, why would you believe so deeply in a furnace? It's not just that, you know, we want to show the world that you can have good service. Yeah, I mean, it's gotta be, it's your home. You know, it's, it's built into our daily trainings, it's built into our culture, um, that we're gonna do whatever it takes to have each client say they love us, period. That's why we spend all the hours in the training that we do, and if we guarantee it's gonna be a good experience for you, or else it's free. What type of work do you think we're going to do? <laughs> there is a guarantee. Temperature selection guarantee, fixed rider it's free guarantee, comfort guarantee, best value guarantee, all of these guarantees hold us accountable to ensuring that we exceed your expectations. And if for whatever reason we fail and we can't make it right, we guarantee all of those guarantees with a 100% money back guarantee. I mean, if you don't think that your technician can fix it right, are you going to say that to a client? No. <laughs> You don't have to worry about having a technician come to your house. We drug test, background check all of our team members. We put safe people in your home. Each and every one of our service techs, 400 hours a year in training. You tell it the minute they walk in the door. They know what they're doing, they've done their homework, and they actually truly care about what you want. Because at the end of the day, you're the person that makes sure I have a job. They're gonna be listening. They're gonna wanna know what your challenges are. Then they're gonna come and give you options and, and you get to choose. If I'm there to help and I make it easy and painless, I did my job right that day. Well, when it comes to your comfort, safety, and your family. You know, you don't necessarily go buy the most expensive, but you get the most bang for your buck. Oh, it's worth it because there's a lot of people that will find a way to get it to work right now and then leave and then come back, charge you again. And, and the cycle just repeats itself. So when I'm out there looking at the furnace, I want to find why it failed today. How can we change the part today with something that you're not going to have to worry about? Is it worth changing the part today? I mean, you can put a lot of money into a furnace. I can fix parts all day. There's good job security in that for me. But is it the right thing for you? I get a lot of the phone calls of after the technicians are there. They're just in awe. They're like, wow, you guys are great. I mean, I don't even know what to say. You guys are great. Everything you did is perfect. It's great. <laughs> Keep going, though. I like this. <laughs> just give us a try. I'm going to take all the risk. I've got the time to make this right. I've got the support to make it right. Just check us out. And if you don't see the value in what we do. I mean, fixed writer, it's free or 100% money back. Enough said. And I am Tamara Scott. Thank you for staying tuned with us. We just left Lee Stranahan. We will get him back on air. We'll either, um, if, he, if he's game, maybe we can just pre-tape for the Christmas show right now. And even if you can't watch at Christmas Day, you can always uh, watch any of our shows, archive them. They're at Tamara Scott Live on YouTube, Tamara Scott Live on YouTube. And I know Lee ha has videos and YouTube uh, photos and stuff that he would like to show you as far as his, his work and what he was able to accomplish and, and, and expose in Syria as well. So we will, we will touch base with him. Joining me right now is Dr. Charles Nestor. I have been able to communicate and interview Dr. Nestor, gosh, I'm trying to think back, probably 2005, 2006, maybe a little bit before that, when I first learned of his Operation Nativity. And uh, throughout the years, uh, on different radio stations, I think he's been with me now through maybe four different radio stations as, as the show has expanded or grown and, and been on different uh, uh, different studios. Dr. Nestor, thank you for joining me. It's my pleasure. Great to be with you today. 
I appreciate your willingness to always come on air when I ask you. Uh, this Tell us a little bit about Operation Nativity and why you started such. And then we I know we only have, you know, 10 minutes, maybe 8 minutes, but I want to talk about what we just had happen at the U.S. Supreme Court. We had a live nativity on the U.S. Supreme Court property, correct? That, that's correct, and that's the result of these uh, many years of growth and progress uh, with Operation Nativity. Uh, it was really born out of the controversy that arose on placing Nativity on public uh, property, on courthouse grounds, city halls, uh, schools, and so forth. And it occurred to me one day, uh, with the number of Christians that are scattered out across this great land of ours, uh, who do believe in the birth of Jesus as a significant event in God's plan for our lives, sending His Son to be our Savior, uh, that why not take advantage of the very properties that we own, our own homes, our businesses, our church facilities, and so forth, and put a nativity uh, up on one's own property. And if that were scattered throughout the communities of uh, the U.S., uh, even though it would be very nice to have it in public places, why not have it in the neighborhoods where people could see them constantly? And that's what Operation Nativity was originally all about. And you didn't. And so over time, it has evolved to the point that with this year, uh, there's actually a live nativity with live animals and, and the characters of the nativity, Mary Joseph, and even a live baby in a manger that was uh, displayed there on the uh, U.S. Supreme Court uh, front steps last week. Last week. And so I'm sure you probably had to have a permit to go through things and do the, the proper channels. But you had a religious display, a Christian display, of the of the nativity on the U.S. Supreme Court, did did Lee Stranahan stay with us, or is he, Lee? Did you ever think that that would be possible in today's climate? He, he's uh, not on right now. Okay. He'll, he will stay as well. Okay, us, so. okay, very good. Um, well, I just I, I'm so pleased with this, Doctor Nestor. You know, if we go back through the history, if we go back at the beginning of this country, our founding fathers could not have been any more clear as to their Judeo-Christian values as they've espoused them in their writings, their private writings, and even their, their public writings. And then we had uh, religious displays on government property. We had sermons preached uh, from the Capitol. We had, I think, one of our pa uh, presidents was a pastor, and others uh, started the Bible Society. So there is no no ignoring or denying that uh, not only is American, America was founded as a Christian nation, but our founding fathers and our presidents throughout have held to deeply uh, held religious convictions, not just of any religion, but on Christianity, as Patrick Henry said, uh, not just on religion, but on the gospel of Jesus Christ. And so uh, I'm so pleased that you were able to accomplish this. In that photo is Rob Shank. Can you tell our viewers who Rob Shank is? And for our viewers, you are seeing the photo in front of the Supreme Court. For those of you who are listening by audio, uh, you can go to faithandaction.org, faithandaction.org, and you'll see the coverage and the photos in front of the U.S. Supreme Court, a nativity. Rob Shank is the director of the ministry called Faith and Action, and it's an outreach to those who are in elected positions and uh, those who are in appointed positions as well, especially in the judiciary. Uh, the headquarters of the ministry is on 2nd Street Southeast, directly uh, across the street from the United States Supreme Court. In fact, you can look from uh, Rob's office and see the chambers of the justices. So he is uh, juxtapositioned uh, right in the back of the position of the judiciary, and he's had with uh, the, his, the, the Supreme Court Historical Society has had a number of opportunities to uh, speak directly into the lives of the justices, uh, some of whom are uh, conservative, uh, Justice Alito, Justice Thomas, of course, uh, as the Chief Justice, uh, maybe to a lesser degree, but nonetheless, uh, typically, he has been on that side of things as well. 
and it has been a, it's been a wonderful thing to see. I, I might just add to your uh, comments about the history of our country. One of my earliest, I grew up in D.C. I was born and raised, I was actually born about two blocks from the White House and grew up went through high school in the District of Columbia. And one of my memories was as a child, uh, probably five or six years old, in the early 50s, like 52, 53, something like that, going to the United States Capitol and hearing Billy Graham preach on the Capitol steps, which is amazing. And what a precious memory to have right now is uh, Franklin Graham just sent out the prayer request for his dad last week. Uh, there is no denying. Those who, those who want to deny it, unfortunately, just somewhat prove their ignorance and lack of knowledge in our history, also our biblical illiteracy. And uh, our founding fathers frowned on that to a great degree as well. So we had this live nativity in front of the U.S. Supreme Court. Dr. Charles Nestor is my guest today, and I'm so pleased, Dr. Nestor. Thank you for what you started with the Nativity Project. Thank you that one man, one vision, was able to bring this into fruition and with the work with Robert Shank. And I hope to meet him when I'm out in D.C. in January and hope that I have something up my sleeve I'd like to talk to him about while I'm there as far as, far as what we could possibly do as well. But uh, his ability, I think I see on his website, he's preached from the Capitol. He's... Uh, um, his cat, his office, as you say, is right across the street. I want to read, if I can, and this is this is from uh, Dan Schaefer, another pastor who wrote the book *In Search of the Real Spirit of Christmas*. This is about nine years old, but I still pull this book off my Christmas, my off the shelf each Christmas. It says the manger scene was designed to, to put me. It was not designed in to put me in the holiday mood. It was intended to shake me to the roots of my soul. Which, by the way, is why each year we have all the fuss and furor about the manger scenes. It originates from folks who, while they don't believe a word of the Christmas story, have thought about it enough to be disturbed by its implications. And that's where we all ought to find ourselves disturbed by the implications that this baby, that this man named Jesus, this, 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 that Jesus was willing to come in the form of a man and suffer and die. It's not just the manger scene. Take your kids this Christmas, not just through the manger, through the babe, but take them to the man in the ministry and the cross on which he died, suffered and died to pay the price for your sins. Because each one of us are sinful. You need only go through the Ten Commandments. We've lied, we've cheated, we've stolen, whatever whatever, you, whatever your hang-up may be, no matter how good you think you are. Uh, if you've had lust in your heart, if you've had um, anger, hate in your heart, Dislike for a brother, same as hatred, same as murder. And Jesus came knowing that by his death, by the shedding of his blood, was the only way that hit that sacrifice could pay for our sins and allow us into heaven with him, which is why we must, we must uh, find Jesus Christ as our personal Savior and repent as our only way into heaven. Dr. Charles Nestor, I think that's probably about the most openly I've laid the gospel out on this show, but how fitting as we come into this Christmas season, and that is the beauty of this holiday, is that it's a great time to share the truth of the word. And until we can share and find it uh, in our culture, we'll continue to have the uprising and the unrest in our culture and in our world today. In closing, what would you like to say to our, our viewers and our listeners, Dr. Ne Dr. Nestor? Well, every, everyone, thank you. Every one of us have the opportunity with our own personal sphere of influence our own personal property, our own personal businesses, whatever they may be, to speak up for Jesus during this time, even if it's just countering the happy holidays with the Merry Christmas. And my wife and I were commenting yesterday, we were uh, in uh, businesses and in a restaurant uh, just yesterday, and people would say happy holidays. But when we said back to them, Merry Christmas, uh, every person responded to our uh, use of the term. And I think if we would just be bold, even if it's just a Merry Christmas, have a blessed New Year and whatever, we have the opportunity to speak up for the Lord and bring more than just a secular idea at this time of the year. Absolutely. And that goes along with our first guest, Lee Stranahan, who says, and he doesn't come at this as a Christian from the Christian community, but he says there is a much larger group. There is a larger group on the right. There's a larger group of conservatives. There's a larger group of Christians if you will make your voice known and how, t how incredibly sad that we don't make our voices known, whether we're the one lone Christian or not, 
We ought to stand on Christ and in doing so, giving others the truth that they might stand with us in the future. But even if they don't, we should, we should for nothing else than what Jesus Christ gave us on the cross, be willing to stand with him. Dr. Charles Nestor has been my guest this second portion. Go to Faith in Action. See for yourself the nativity on our U.S. Supreme Court steps. What a delight to see. And set one out on your lawn. Set one out in your hearts, if nothing else, and speak, as Dr. Nestor said, to all you meet in the stores, uh, on the streets, Merry Christmas, Merry Christmas. And uh, we'll see you next week. Be encouraged. Never be complacent.